Hello and welcome back to Rage Gaming, my name is Hollo and this is Things You Didn't Know in Elden Ring. A series where we look at unexpected details, big or small, things found in game, cut content or otherwise, and at this point largely based on you guys in the comments, providing lots of back and forth and suggestions for the series. So a huge thank you, welcome back, let's begin. To kick us off then, I have multiple points to make about the Erd Tree Guardians and some of their very interesting lore and the subtle details about them. This is a follow up from previous uh, videos where I was talking about the Guardians in garb and the full bloom specific piece. Now it's a really interesting piece because when you're wearing it you actually get bonus healing to your healing flask which is an incredible detail however it will greatly lower your fire damage negation. You could only get these from full bloomed guardians which means you can't get the normal piece from normal guardians. To get a guardian to full bloom though you're going to need to put it to low health and watch it bloom which is uh, how I missed it even though I've got, you know, hundreds and hundreds of hours of playtime. The series is always interesting because it doesn't matter what topic I'm talking about, someone does know about it and they assume everyone else knows. But there's a lot of interesting details to do with the Guardians. For example, the fact that they are literally made up of a tree. You see, the Earth Tree Guardians are those that are fusing with the Earth Tree itself. And as that concept progresses, you can see how the root takes bigger form on these specific ones. And even flowers begin to bloom out of that root, coming from the spine. It's almost like a parasite that seems to grow in these specific enemies. And these enemies, specifically the ones that are just near to the Earth Tree, well, they're further progressed, aren't they? And as you can see, if I hurt them, they can heal themselves using the full-bloomed flowers. And now, the weapon has completely transformed. Look at that. It's like a strange club. And they're fighting in a totally different way because it's literally heavy. This is a super unique style of combat that you only see in these enemies, like a transforming Bloodborne weapon. And you can only see that with these specific enemies when you hurt them, when they use the flowers, and then that transforms their spear into the club. A shame that we can't do that with the Guardian Sword Spears, but I suppose that makes sense. You know, unless we were wearing this chest piece, maybe. The thing about these Guardians, though, is that we see multiple versions of them. We see the original, we see this more progressed Erd Tree version. As you can see, the feet are like roots of a tree at this point. But then what about the third version? Pierce Arner in the comments made this incredible comment talking about the multiple stages of the Guardians. You see, the worm faces also seem to be Erd Tree Guardians, but ones that have been connected and corrupted by death root. I made a whole lore video about Godwin, the Prince of Death, and how he's corrupting the land. In many ways, he shows up all over the world. Literally, in the death root, you can see his eyes staring out blankly and emptily, spreading his presence without knowledge all over the lands between. This is because his body is fused with the roots of the Erd Tree, and the Erd Tree roots spread far over these lands. Many things happen in these specific places, like those that live in Undeath, the skeletons that come back to life. But what about the worm faces? Pierce made the very believable suggestion that, hey, the worm faces could be another corrupted version of something touched by death root. The blight being spread through the roots of the Erd Tree, passing to the Erd Tree Guardians, whose root that's taken hold in their bodies is now corrupted and turns them into these horrible worm-faced monsters. We see the worm faces in some peculiar places, like for example, Faramazula, but death root is also found there. Pierce suggested that Faramazula might have been previously part of the lands between and so things went along as it went into the air the death route went with it but i could also see godwin's ability going beyond just physical connection but either way there's some really interesting details to do with these earth tree guardians they're various versions and very unique mechanics and i like this theory that the worm faces are just corrupted earth tree guardians like pierce suggests Next up, we have the very interesting Blood Flame Blade and Black Flame Blade. These two incantations are pretty incredible. We can get the Cursed Blood on our weapon, so we can now do bleed damage with our weapon a bit better, and also a bit of the fire. And then we have Black Flame Blade, which is much faster, pretty cool incantation, and then that gives us the damage over time effect of the Black Flame. However, as I've shown in various videos, and even made builds around this concept, because it's really cool, apply them to a weapon, and then that can be converted to ranged damage using an Ash of War. So, say, with the 
the beast roar, you can beast roar while you've got black flame on your weapon, and that will trigger black flame on an enemy at range, even though you've not hit them with the weapon that's buffed. Or we could go further with blood flame blade, apply that to our weapon, which then puts bleed damage on our weapon, and use a range dash of war, which will then hit an enemy and do bleed build up, actually able to proc bleed from range on an ash of war. It's a really interesting, strange interaction. I'm not sure if it's intended, but it's been a thing in the game for a while, and we've made two builds around it, which are really effective and fun. It goes further than these specific two things though, and this is how it kind of works. You see, it works right now, I can do Blood Flame Blade on my weapon, but now with the same Ash of War and the same weapon, I can no longer do the incantation. That is because I've set my weapon's affinity to magic. Using the whetstones, you can change the affinity of a weapon tied to an Ash of War. So we have a magical Ash of War, so I can do magic here, I could do cold on this one. Or with a lightning one, we could do lightning or sacred. The problem is these element-based affinities that go on our weapon, well, then they no longer allow other statuses to go on, such as blood flame, such as black flame. So to enhance a Ash of War in this way, you need to have it in a sort of neutral state, be it standard, heavy, or keen, or even quality. But as soon as it's got a status or an element like lightning or sacred, it can no longer take that incantation. But if I put this Ash of War into Keen, such as Lightning Ram like this, I can now use Lightning Ram to deal lightning damage and bleed build up at the same time because I got both of these effects while using this Ash of War, which is a hilarious and stupid combination and incredible that it works this way. This allows us to enhance our Ashes of War in very interesting ways to create ranged black fire or bleed in combination with other statuses like Frost, like Lightning, or your neutral Ashes of War such as the Beast Raw. The potential here is crazy. It makes these two buffs way more effective and way more relevant in the meta, which is quite exciting. It's something I've not seen much of and I'm happy to have been looking at it recently. Thank you to Twisted Bow for further explaining the details of this. It's nice to understand the concept behind this and how it works and how far you can actually use it with all the many different Ashes of War and combinations of statuses and elements. I'm standing in the Cathedral of the Forsaken for this next one. This is the first Moog fight, if you come this way, and leads to the frenzied ending, or at least leads you up to what unlocks that. It's a very important area, there's a lot of incredibly good loot, and it requires you go to go through one of the worst areas in the game, one of the most annoying areas, especially the first time you go through it, which is the sewers under Lindell, an absolute nightmare of a place. Obviously, I would recommend you go through that in your first playthrough anyway, just to experience it. But hey, if you're doing a New Game Plus playthrough or a new character playthrough, if you could get down here significantly quick and basically bypass that whole sewer area, that'd be something pretty damn nice, wouldn't it? Well, as it turns out, there's a way to do that using this lift. This is the lift that takes you all the way down there when you originally follow the normal way around. But as you can see, there's actually an opening on the other side. I enter on the side I'm facing and this just faces out into nothing, this huge drop. Because this is actually open, you can land on a ledge above and drop down onto this and skip that whole terrible area. Let me show you. From the subterranean shunning grounds or the underground roadside grace that you find basically upon entering this whole underground area, you're gonna come down this ladder the grace is on your left, and we have this opening area. Now, you can open all these doors and create these massive shortcuts, and I've obviously already done that, so I'm gonna show you that. But to get through here normally, you'd need to drop down this grate and progress through the tunnels and the sewer pipes themselves. Once you've come through here though, you'll come through this door on my left, and you'll open up this door right here, which leads to a familiar area. This is where we were coming up on that elevator a second ago. If we drop down here on the left, we can do a small skip, not a major one, but nice to be able to do. And we run all the way down here until we meet this fella at this ledge. And from this ledge right here, which you can actually see other people doing this skip and failing it, hopefully I'll do it first time. You can see how he jumps down onto that ledge just next to the elevator down on that corner. His problem is that he was a bit too far to the right, so he slid off. The idea is to press against the wall like this and then simply jump and land on that ledge without falling off. It's no easy thing, but with some practice, you'll be able to do it first try, unlike me. I was made aware of the skip after seeing the video by Life After Death Gaming on YouTube, who showed a little tutorial on how to get here and unlock everything and do the jump. So it's well worth checking out his channel and watching the video if you wanna see the full tutorial. 
Now, alternatively to that pretty damn hard jump, uh, what you could do if you are, say, doing a new play for a new game plus, is you could bring out the Hand of Melania, the boss weapon of Melania. The Waterfall Dance can be used for many different little skips around the world, and we saw some very interesting ones with speedrunners trying to skip areas in Faramazula. But it can be used here as well at the elevator for a very easy skip, literally just aiming towards the elevator and then pressing against the wall during the long combination and landing on top of the elevator and dropping onto it. I was able to do that literally first try a lot easier than the jump skip. How about a pretty silly one? If you come here in a new playthrough or to the third church of America and use the bonfire, you'll be able to speak to Melina. And for some reason, this specific bonfire, when she's summoned in to speak to you, she's vulnerable to damage. The problem is you're obviously sat out of grace, so you can't really attack her directly. But what you could do is do a damaging spell or incantation, putting down a poison mist cloud. Or like I do here, using fire's deadly sin to damage myself and enemies nearby me or allies, apparently. So while I'm sat at the grace at the bonfire and she's talking to me she's just continuously taking damage and you could actually kill her through these methods now she doesn't actually drop anything of relevance and this is just a net negative obviously not a good thing to do but it's quite interesting that this can be done and was found by a Japanese youtuber quite a few months back I remember hearing about it and thinking there's no way that gets left in the game and here we are today patch 1.06 and it's still there and you can still accidentally kill her although I would say it's hard to accidentally accidentally do this because it does take a bit of damage. She's got a fair amount of health. You're going to need multiple ways of damaging her more effectively to make it happen. But yeah, if you really hate Melina, you can damage her and you can kill her, which is a weird thing to know, but there you go. In a fairly recent episode of this series, we took a look at the cut content of the VFX of Morgoth's Holy Armaments. What you're seeing is a clever rework of those VFX. As it turns out, there were some suitably tarnished or player-sized versions of those effects you see in the Margit and Morgoth fights. A very clever modder by the name of Clever Raptor 6, in fact, made a mod where you could include that in your game and actually use them, which is really cool. But as it turns out, Raptor's also been working on other interesting combinations I've recently talked about in the series how the potential for Elden Ring modding is insane and it goes beyond just level design. There are so many incredible magic abilities, incantations or ashes of war that work in various ways. But if you were to take some of these effects and apply them to other weapons and change those combinations, you could create totally new movesets which are ridiculously powerful and very cool looking. And that's exactly what Clever Raptor has been doing. Using that VFX, using those different abilities and combining them into totally different playstyles and ways to fight. Creating a whole pack of mods to change your combat, leading to incredible things like air bending based on your movement or evading, as well as fire bending because obviously, then taking say death magic and applying it to a katana, enhancing those awesome effects like the Mariah's Executioner Sword and making them a little bit more exciting. It's true that some weapons, especially certain legendary armaments like the Executioner Sword, were incredible in the boss fights, but not so incredible when the player, you, gets to use them. It's nice to see various movesets being enhanced in this way not only is it visually impressive but it looks really fun to use too so once again shout out to clever raptor 6 check him out on nexus mods he's making some incredible stuff but there you have it that's another episode of things you didn't know in elden ring if you guys have any suggestions for the next episode let me know in the comments but yeah today it surprises me what kind of bugs are still in the game what kind of skips the devs actually have an interesting history of removing certain skips in the game there used to be this root skip you could do in Kaelid, which would allow you to bypass celia the town of sorcery and the puzzle there but then they basically cleared up the roots on the wall so you couldn't do that anymore still many skips still exist like the one in today's video it would seem so let me know if you know of any other Others. For now, though, I've been Hollow. You've been you. Thanks very much for watching. We'll see you next time. Josh, Cotton, and Hollow with the videos. Dropping the humor like a hammer on your tippy toes. Bringing entertainment on a daily arrangement to take our insanity and turn it into entertainment. Yes, I said entertainment twice. To reiterate that it is nice. To look into your faces on a mostly daily basis when you let us in your homes to make the whole world a stage. Is, uh, goodbye.